Um, the, uh, so I'm, I'm so happy that uh, <coughs> South Sudan has been selected as one of the countries as a case study. What's good with it is to zoom in to the uh, to the uh, to the to these case studies because they're quite important and may reflect a lot of challenges facing uh, us uh, in, in our countries. And South Sudan is very unique and and very uh, and I think. It's one of the cases that at least is hurting the continent. But I want to position it within, within this region. Uh, you can call it Horn of Africa, you can call. But this is, this is the region where you have most of the problem of Africa are well reflected here. And I could say it's actually a microcosm of, the, uh, of Africa. In terms of fragility, in terms of uh, fighting over resources, uh, in terms of maritime security. And, and this region, every 10 years, there is an occurrence of famine. It is a very, and it's a pattern. So this is where, I, this is where South Sudan emerged in this, in this region. That is so uh, difficult region. Now, <clears throat> when, when this country emerged uh, and become, uh, became the, uh, to its independence, in 2011, I think there were a lot of hopes and expectations about this country. And I think it's one of the, uh, it, it got a lot of attention and support regionally, internationally. Uh, when everybody was expecting it to be a, a hopeful country that can contribute to the stability in the region. And, and in actual fact, the, the regression that has happened in South Sudan, it will be a collective responsibility, but definitely the people of South Sudan, they have the the lion's share of the blame. Now, some, some facts, some basic information that I would like to share with you uh, about South Sudan. This is a country that has been experiencing civil war over and over. It's just like a, it, 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 it entered into three civil wars, uh, including the current one now. Uh, and a long history of fighting for their own identity and from the Islamic government in, 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 in Sudan. Um, the population about 12 million <coughs> and with about 64 ethnic groups, but there are two big ethnic groups, Dinka and Nuer, because I just want to highlight them because I will refer to them later on. And up, dominant African religion and but majority educated are Christians, and there's a very growing number of, uh, of Muslims. It is well endowed with resources, unbelievable. Leaf oil, even water itself. The water is about 80, I mean the Nile Basin, about 85% of the Nile, well, Nile Basin actually in, in South Sudan. So, so and leave alone the, uh, the other resources. It's, it's a really rich country uh, by all the standards uh, and untapped resources. As I mentioned, it took its uh, independence in two, two, 2011 after, after the peace agreement. And the peace agreement, I will talk a bit about it. And this peace agreement gave the people of Southern Sudan the right of self-determination. And the idea was whether Sudan can make the peace to unit to be attractive and uh, before the people of Southern Sudan could vote for the uh, for the uh, for the their independence, of which the, the, the two parties failed to to make the unity attractive, and that resulted in the secession of South Sudan from the from Sudan. But this one raised a very important questions about what happened, because South Sudan used to to talk about Arab Arabism, the Islam in the north. But now they are left alone as African, but then they, they couldn't live forever. I mean, because they, they just went into, into war within less than two, two years. And created a debate about what are then the, the root causes of this conflict. I think sometimes we spend a lot of time about the, the driver like grievance and greed uh, whether it's uh, what I talk to you sometimes back about the, the way the liberation movement managed the, uh, the affairs of the state after, the, uh, after they, 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 they get into power. 
or whether it is oil itself. Uh, but even the most important thing, the, 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 the visionary leader. I think it's, it's something coming immediately now and again, because South Sudan lost its uh, leader at the time that actually much, much needed in, during that, uh, that time. And then I will talk a bit about regional politics. Uh, the politics around oil, Nile waters, hegemony, and then borders and security. But all these drivers could not explain better. And I think I want to summarize the centrality of weak institutions, an issue of the social contract. And this, the issue of the trust, social cohesion is, is explained a lot because rather than the, what the, 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 the dominant argument about these uh, grievances and, uh, and, and I will highlight this issue of social contract and social cohesion as a very important. Just to, to make a case, just to show you how the state is still the issue of the, the state building itself is, is still in, in, in progress. It's not, it's an issue. I guess we have conducted a, a research to ask South, South Sudanese how, to what level do they feel about being South Sudanese or being to your ethnic group or to your region. Even after the independence, about, about 52 people, they, they feel, they don't feel that is strong about the state itself. And even after the conflict, Almost 62% saying actually the, the, the feeling of being South Sudan is, is weaker. So you could see clearly the state formation is a big issue. And the feeling and the absence of this relationship between the state and the society is so, is so weak. And we need really to focus on some of these issues to do with our nation and the way. And South Sudan is a good example. I mean, the, the state that we are having maybe that, that we are having them, but not really came as a result of engaging the citizen in order to forge this nation. Now, and just to reflect you, I use the fragility index in order to show you also what happened over time with the, uh, with the horizontal relationship between, between the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the citizen among themselves or vertical relationship. And you could see clearly this is the maximum score of 10. And it's a very a clear case that the, uh, the social contract was actually withering away and eroding in South Sudan. And that could explain the fragility that we saw immediately why South Sudan entered into, into conflict. Now, with this war, civil war, the, uh, the IGAD took a very specific step in order to mediate peace agreement. And I want just to talk about this peace agreement. It was signed in 2015, mediated by IGAD. But for the first time, the level of participation was so high, especially for the first time to see women, youth, civil society, and other political party, parties. Usually, the power sharing people tend to focus on the warring parties. But for this exercise, for the first time, people managed to include other stakeholders. Quite inclusive in, in a way. And then in, in, so the, the normal one, trans, transitional government was to be formed with a lot of reforms. A lot of reforms to be made uh, and, and also decision making to be on basis on the consensus. And, uh, and, and, and the power were done in such a way no, no, no party to have an upper hand in terms of the, uh, of the decision. A clear case of permanent, uh, good provision for permanent ceasefire and transition security arrangement, including the, uh, the strategic defense and review and security review. A lot of economic reforms in, in, this, in this, especially in the oil sector, because this is where you have a very high level of corruption. But the most important thing about the transition justice and accountability, I think for the first time, African Union took initiative of, uh, of, uh, of conducting uh, inquiry to the atrocity committee when the war erupted in South Sudan. And that resulted now in ha having what is called hybrid court. So a hybrid court in order to really bring to books those who committed uh, atrocities in South Sudan. And it's a very, one of the very good, innovative, uh, I mean, for African Union to take such a ch such, such challenge and to take upon itself the issue of justice uh, as a priority. And then permanent constitution, elections, but even a debate in South Sudan about issues of federalism 
and, and, and decentralization. And these are some of the issues some of us believe are very important to be put on the table in, in, in order to manage the diversity. So it's a very, so very comprehensive uh, sort of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of agreement. But then this agreement did not, was not implemented at all. And it's almost dead, actually. What happened, actually, it was rather very ambitious. Especially when you look to the implementation matrix model, too ambitious. And uh, it's a clear case of also the way it was designed. Everybody was hurriedly departed to sign it, but it was too ambitious. Uh, second, the whole of political will. Usually in peace agreement, people look at the product of the agreement, but people that don't look at the process of making agreement. And through the negotiations, people will be able to build the trust among the parties. The comprehensive peace agreement that was signed in 2005, although it was between two antagonistic sort of parties, the Islamic Front in, in, of Sudan, and then the SPLM in the South. But then the one they started negotiating, especially the leaders, they really managed to build relationships among themselves. And that one helped a lot when, when implementing the Comprehensive Peace Agreement. The last peace agreement, 2015, did not have that one, although South Sudanese among themselves. But the, 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 uh, the antagonistic spirit was so bad between the two leaders, who happened to be from these two, 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 two communities, the Nuer and the Dinka. And, uh, and, and that's why, although they signed agreement, they, didn't, they were not that committed to, to, the, uh, to the spirit of the agreement. And also, the, whether you can have his agreement, that is a win-win. In most cases, it is a zero-sum game. People did not see it, some of the, especially the elite, did not see it as a as a win, as a win-win uh, solution. And then the politics of big tribes. I think it's going to face Africa. How to manage these big tribes, if especially in the way we are handling the politics. And these big tribes, they're becoming source of instability. And especially in South Sudan. Because usually what happens, you get the small tribes, they don't engage in war. And when you have a peace agreement, power sharing agreement, it is these big ones tending to share this power among, among themselves. And then you have the, those, at the, uh, the minority are not actually becoming part of the year. Uh, and what happened now, the political leadership in South Sudan is along ethnic line, especially the current government now is looking at the, the former is called Dinka, Council, which is actually advising the government that there's no political party. And, and in actual fact, there is a very fractured society now uh, along this uh, ethnic line. Dealing with losers or winners during war, and I mean during peace, is a big issue. Now let me focus on the regional, the regional actors, what, uh, the eager that actually mediated this, uh, I'm not sure. I want to discuss these, these countries, the one I showed you, but they, they, it is interesting that they, uh, they have their own interests. And South Sudan becoming a battlefield for pursuing these interests. If you take Sudan, Sudan is a very a long, it has definitely economic interest, because the pipeline is actually passing through, so I mean, the export of oil of South Sudan is through Sudan. So they have a very key, big interest in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in South Sudan. Security-wise, because there are some rebels in, in the South, I mean, rebels of Sudan are actually in South Sudan. Uh, and that one created a big issue, instability too. too. Then there's this whole politics of Nile. It's a big, a big, a big, a big issue. And then the pipeline. Because South Sudan is depending on pipeline through the Sudan, and the, the behavior of Sudan was so bad, so South Sudan was looking for another alternative pipeline. And that one created a situation whereby it would have been better for South to be weak and not to think about another pi pipeline away from, from Sudan. And then the, uh, the same thing with Ethiopia. Ethiopia actually is playing a very, a very subtle role, in, the, in, 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 but it has a very clear security interest in South Sudan. 
uh, besides the other interests, uh, as I mentioned. And, and then definitely Kenya. Kenya is a very important, uh, especially the economic interests of, of Kenya is quite important in, in South Sudan. I group this, the Sudan, Ethiopia, and Kenya as one group. This is a group that believe that the peace agreement that is almost dying, they could be, it could be, it could be revitalized. Then the second group is Uganda, Egypt, Eritrea. It's another group. And, and Uganda uh, and Egypt and Eritrea, they, they believe that they, this peace agreement is giving chance to Sudan to be, uh, to be, to be to give, giving chance to Sudan to be the one uh, driving this process of peace, of peace agreement. And that's why they look into why, whether they could go, uh, help the, the unification of the SPLM, the ruling party, to. But as you can see here, the region has a lot, but these are the very region that actually mediated the peace agreement. There's a debate now with the failure of, of, of the peace agreement, whether this argument of subsidiarity, whether it can be removed, the, the negotiation to be moved from IGAD to a higher level. Maybe these are some of the debates, these are discussions people are talking. Because if you move it also to African Union, then African Union having also its own problem, a lot of problem, even more complicated than the, uh, than the, uh, than IGAD. Maybe somewhere we need to strike a balance uh, because of the, uh, because in this case of IGA, the, a clear failure of subsidiarity argument, whether you can continue with such interest that I, I have shown you. Now, then is it possible this agreement can be revitalized? I think just let me, uh, what we have now, as Kate mentioned, uh, South Sudan, is the, uh, is, the, uh, is the one exporting refugees, the largest exporter of refugees on the continent. Half of the population almost either displaced or are refugees. And um, a very clear case of human rights abuses. Uh, uh, and then, then the, the famine that I mentioned, and also the economy that depending on oil is actually it's becoming a big issue for South Sudan. So instead itself is not able to, to sustain itself. Uh, although the IGAD, they have started the revitalization of this peace agreement, there are a lot of doubt about whether this agreement will, be, will survive and whether we can, people can start having a new discussion around this peace agreement. And then the, the issue of lack of political will and the state itself becoming a source of insecurity. And I will, I will discuss later on about what are the options available. Um, now, is it possible for you to use if the parties are actually not, not able to implement the peace agreement? What are the leverages? What are the carrots and sticks that you can be able to use at the regional level or even at the, uh, at the, at the international level? Now, let me, so what is the future? What does the future hold for South Sudan? There are about four scenarios. One, the current status quo is first as an issue of legitimacy. The government that is now in power not being elected, the agreement itself is, is finishing next year, and it would be extremely difficult for you to have the elections. And it's creating a dilemma to what level, how can this government continue? To, to, to be in the government without legitimacy. There's a likelihood that this, man, this, this situation may deteriorate to the level of like, actual this and anarchy now. And that one becoming a problem for the whole region. South Sudan becoming a destabilizing uh, 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 country now in the, uh, in the region. There's a fear that some countries actually express it for a military intervention if the situation continues like this, unabated. And, uh, and the whole lot of intervention, because in one way, one of these neighboring countries may intervene to South Sudan and take over the power and, and bring other people, um, other, other people, to it, like what, what, what like in, uh, in car. So this is leaving us with what are the, uh, uh, just some of the questions, just to conclude some of the, uh, one, a peace agreement fails, what should be done? And it's a big question uh, for, for, for the region and for the international community. 
can, is it possible to allow the situation to continue while watching it? Uh, the people are dying. Is it possible this unilateral foreign military intervention a solution? There's a debate about this issue. If the state is failing, this idea of the, uh, the new trusteeship of South Sudan as a solution, because there's a debate within some African scholars like Mamdani saying South Sudan should be put under the uh, uh, regional administration for a period of time. Okay, here, I think there's a book here, I hope you will be able to see it, uh, putting South Sudan under the international administration, administration for a longer period until the state itself is, is, is formally established. Otherwise, we're going to see a recurrent of war and, 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 and vulnerability. Some of us will come involved with, with IGAD about a possibility of having a hybrid of, uh, of, of inter because there's a, a clear capacity deficit in South Sudan, a possibility of having national transitional uh, administration together with African <laughs> Union involvement and also with international involvement. In key sectors, for example, in the security sector, now the, the whole of these 64 ethnic groups are divided themselves into, into along the ethnic line. Everybody is having their own militias to protect themselves. Uh, you, have, you have now the, uh, so there's no way you can say you can form a national army. And that's why experience like experience of Liberia is a good example, whereby you may need to have outsourcing until the, the real national army is established. Even in the banking, the central bank, people are saying, given the, the, the low level of trust, is it possible for this, the banking system or the central bank to be governed by a non-South Sudanese? And even the oil, the oil itself. So there's a lot of debate of how much South Sudan can rebuild itself with the support of the region and the, uh, and the international community. And this is the thing facing Africa and, and, and South Sudan becoming a big, a big, a big issue. Uh, and, and one doesn't know what is going to happen in the coming uh, few months to come. Uh, let me stop here and thank you.